Welcome to The Vault. Tune in every week to unlock the marketing secrets of some of the fastest growing businesses. You'll hear practical tips, strategies, and case studies that will help you build incredible marketing campaigns for your business. And now, here's your host, Stacey Keogh. Today's guest is so inspirational. Tony J. Salemi is an authority on psychology of success, well-being, and human behavior. He works with people all around the world solving their personal, professional, and business problems so that they can achieve excellence in all areas of life, emotional, physical, spiritual, mental, business, money, and love. His clientele includes celebrities, millionaire business owners, and even some of the world's billionaires. Tony has been interviewed by Jack Cranfield, Brian Tracy, and has appeared as an expert on over 100 TV and radio appearances, including Sky TV, ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox, reaching over 50 million viewers worldwide. He is the co-creator of Living My Illusion, a multi-award winning real-life coaching documentary series, which instantly became a global phenomenon. Throughout this conversation, we discuss his two books, the four times number one bestseller, A Path to Wisdom, and Hashtag Loneliness. Tony is dedicated to inspiring all women and men to become masters of their own success. Are you ready for this? Let's unlock the vault that is Tony's extraordinary journey. Hello, Tony. Welcome to the show. We're so pleased to have you here today. Hey, Stacey, how are you doing? Very well. How are you? Extremely well. Good, good. Well, I'm very excited to be interviewing you today. You've obviously got an extraordinary journey and also business that you run. So I'd love to kick things off by telling our audience a little bit about yourself. So do you want to start with a little bit about your background and and how you got into doing what you do? Sure. I was born in Macedonia in a small place called Gostiva, situated between the mountains of Western Macedonia, a very picturesque place, family of restaurateurs. My parents had few businesses, but also a farm. So I grew up in a farm with no technology, but I was very curious about life. And also I saw a lot of injustice in the society back in the 70s, and especially injustice towards women and the way of living, meaning anybody who was different, you never felt you belong somewhere. And one of the things I remember is I had so many different health challenges uh, as a young kid. I always wanted to go around the world and heal people. I had this like dream of actually traveling the universe and I never really felt I come from Earth. So actually that pushed me into, <laughs> into, into studying science, uh, cosmology, biology, technology. I just wanted to find the answers to life's greatest secrets. Yeah, sounds like a very curious individual. That's a great way to be. Yeah, I mean, this was one thing from an early age. Uh, this is what I wanted to do. Then back at home in Macedonia, I was one of the top uh, students in maths and science and technology, which then led me to study in one of the top universities in former Yugoslavia in Zagreb. But as I basically finished my first year, the civil war fell upon us and I was conscripted against my will into the civil war and trained to be a soldier. Wow. And basically experiencing for more than 14 months the horrors of a civil war, um, which some people, some audiences may relate to that. Maybe personally, maybe they have somebody who's experienced that. But that made me question everything, uh, Stacey, everything about life. It damaged me mentally, emotionally, physically in every single sense. I lost family. I lost friends. I lost my identity. I lost everything I knew. Yeah. Everything was born to do. An absolutely and, devastating yeah, period in time, really, that was. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And uh, miraculously, my life was saved, and my mom put me on a one-way flight to London, where I ended up being homeless for quite a few months. And uh, it was uh, another difficult moment because um, the separation from the family, from the identity, from the country I knew, to actually suddenly finding yourself homeless on the streets with no friends, with no money, with no job, with nobody to go to, was really some of my frightest, frightening moments in my life. That and I actually couldn't even speak English. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I was wondering whether you would have spoken English or not. Yeah, it's, been, it's, a, it's a horrific sort of ordeal to have to have gone through. And I think 
uh, you know, obviously there were not just yourself, there were many people affected by this, which is just, it's just a devastating um, well, moment in time, as I said. How do you feel that has, how do you find that? I mean, what, tell me a little bit more, go deeper, <laughs> tell me. So because, <laughs> because it's it's difficult, isn't it? For, some, for somebody like myself that comes from, you know, third world, I'm actually from New Zealand originally, and I've lived in London for the last 12 years. And I'm privileged, you know, I don't really have any experience that I can relate to on that level. Um, I remember meeting some refugees from Croatia and those sorts of things when that was happening. And a lot of them were coming to my school and things like that in New Zealand. But apart, it's very, I was very removed from that situation, you know. So tell me a little bit about, you know, how... You're lucky because you come from a land of Jurassic Park, you know. <laughs> You're famous for that. And it's one of my wish to, to go, to, go to New Zealand and, and explore the greenery and potentially do all of my uh, uh, coaching and uh, training work and then run my seminars and workshops because uh, I've met so many amazing uh, people from New Zealand, just like you've met somebody from Croatia. Mm-hmm. But if you think about it, it's uh, what's uh, really always, I find it extremely both curious, but also disheartening that we consistently do that. We consistently destroy countries, destroy cultures and destroy people and we leave people homeless. So when I look at the former Yugoslavia, pretty much was consisted of so many different nationalities working together uh, uh, towards one aim. And everybody was, I mean, I'm not sure if you've been in former Yugoslavia or now it's in different countries, but we had a very, very beautiful country. None of us grew up thinking we're going to be suffering from a civil war. We actually were trained as soldiers to fight against an outside enemy, but nobody was prepared for what really happened over 10 years of civil war, which, uh, you know, many people even today find it very difficult to digest how your neighbor turned to be your worst enemy or how your partner that you married turns your enemy because a lot of marriages were broken as a result of because there was people being married in different nationalities, in different religions, because back in former Yugoslavia, people did not have this like mindset of you have to marry into your own nationality or something like that. Mm. So a lot of people ended up homeless in themselves. Forget about physically, many people, you know, migrated as refugees around Europe, around the world. But in yourself, you end up being homeless. And the emotions behind basically your entire identity is destroyed. So when you go somewhere in a new country, the first thing it's about really recollecting yourself and bringing yourself to at least some form of normality of what life could offer you in another country. And you literally have to start life from zero. Yeah, starting again. So for you, I mean, is that because you mentioned earlier that you had that, you know, hope as a child and you had that curiosity. And I would imagine that you lose a little bit of that going through that period. Or or was it the opposite for that for you? I think, Stacey, it was both. It's, there are moments like for, when I first came to England, <clears throat> it's, I remember being homeless on the streets of London. I used to sleep underneath the bridges of River Thames. And you can imagine a child from being taken away from a family, uh, having lost so much, both mentally, emotionally and physically losing people. Mm. And then nobody was aware of my predicament and being homeless. You know, we have these perceptions about homeless people that I believe we need to break those and really get to understand the true reason behind homelessness. Yeah, for because sure. here I am finding myself homeless. I mean, my mother borrowed some money just to get me by until I sort myself out. I used to live on a slice of bread a day and a bit of milk, an apple and some water. That was my life for almost six months. Amazing. Now, most people, they will see a 19 years old, 20 years old on the street having their own perceptions. But for me, those f- few months, I was just crying crying and crying until I had no tears left. Mm. I did not know how to handle grief, how to handle the separation, whether I will ever see my mom again. My dad was captured in uh, in Bosnia by the Serbs at that time. So I had zero certainty about what my life is going to be. The only thing I knew is I find myself on one hand feeling safe, on the other hand, grieving for the family I left behind that maybe 
uh, I will never see again. Yeah, and we were maybe not as safe as, as you were living, you know, in Correct. the UK at that time. It's, yeah, devastating. And for many of us also, uh, Stacey, you have this guilt uh, that's saying, why me? Mm. And this guilt about, you know, for me, I I didn't really understand back then my mom's choice to save my life. Yeah. Because for me, it was like, I will die with my mom. If I have a choice, I'll die with my mom. But for her, it was saving her child. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's only later on that I actually understood how a, a parent will give up anything to save their children. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So then t- tell us what happened from there. So you were 18, 19 years old in London, you know, living under a bridge, really trying to deal with everything that had just happened over the last few years. What was the change for you? How did you how did you move forward out of this situation? One of the things I used to love, Stacey, I used to love reading books. So any books that I would uh, find being left over, I would take it on and read it. And while I was reading a book, a lady approached me and she's, you know, she just uh, left me some money and we started a conversation. And this is when I believe in synchronicities. And that lady was somebody who was from Macedonia, married in England and pretty much sorted with her life and everything else. And when I told her where I come from and she started talking to me in Albania and she was just tearful uh, seeing me in that situation. So she offered me to help me out um, uh, to come and stay with her for the weekend. And she said to me, over the weekend, I'll find your job. I'll help you find a job. And exactly what she did, you know, I went at her flat at the time. She used to live in Elskold. Her name is Anissa. And basically the next day she gave me a couple of addresses. I went and spoke to these people and straight away on that day, I was offered a job in an Italian restaurant in St. James's uh, near Piccadilly. And basically, I lived and worked there. So the first like a year and a half, I was there every single day working 16 to 18 hours a day. Mm. So I ended up learning Italian. But then I started meeting people. I started my healing journey, frankly, started when you start really serving and really being busy with your life. You start slowly healing, although everything was happening, but it gave me this stuff. I can earn money. I can send money. I can help my family back in the war zone. So for me, in in the early 90s, it wasn't about really how to sort my life. It was about how can I earn money and uh, help my family in the war zone. And then how can I take myself from where I am? to going back into education because my dream since I was a kid is finish an engineering degree and really go become a CIO in a company and really explore what technology can do for humanity, for companies. So when I started there, after a year and a half, I entered myself into an evening English school. And then at the same time, I started my higher national diploma at Westminster College. So I started working four or five different jobs to pay for my schooling because I wasn't entitled because it took the home office about eight years before they actually honored my refugee status. Wow. And during that period, I had the choice to either not educate myself and just work or pay for myself and move on. And I personally decided to work nonstop to pay for my education and move on. And funny enough, during this six years doing my higher national diploma, then doing my degree at University College London. I did engineering, psychology, and human behavior. Mm. Uh, When I actually graduated, on the same week, I got my citizenship. So it was really amazing how universe works. Wow, isn't it just? Yeah, brilliant. During this period is where I started really meeting people from different nationalities and also where I met my first healer. Uh, I was working at Harvey Nicks as a sales assistant for Mulberry and the lady who worked at Aqua Di Parma, Lova, uh, she actually was my first healer. She really introduced me back into the healing world, the same healing world that my grandparents used to teach me. And they took me when back when I was in Macedonia as a child, I almost died in hospital. So my parents took me to this healer. And this is where all of this started really connecting backwards and forwards. And during this turbulent time. Yes, I lost faith in humanity. I lost faith in God. I lost faith that anything's possible because I used to ask the question, how is it possible so many children to be brutally murdered? How is it possible that everything my parents who fought in the Second World War built suddenly was all destroyed? How can we do that to one another? And this, those questions really uh, focused me into my uh, academic achievements. And then when I graduated from UCL, I started my technology career, but still kept a very close interest in personal development, spiritual development, healing work, business development, cognitive behavior, and really understanding the brain. 
So tell us more about this healing process. How how did this this woman that you'd obviously met through work, what what did that look like? Well, I mean, she started really introducing me in, in different healing modalities, in, including Reiki, including uh, Body Mirror System of Healing, which is uh, one of the founders is Martin Brofman about the chakras. And I started really, really reconnecting what my elderly is that basically who told my parents one day I'll become a master healer. All of those information started coming back to me. And I remember working with her and then she introduced me to a guy who used to work in Victoria at the time, uh, in Victoria Station. He had a very tiny little office. And uh, first time when he actually, I met him, uh, Lova, she actually uh, used to buy me sessions uh, for my birthday or once a month just to make me smile. So she literally wanted me to go back into the healing world because when she saw me, she, the moment she touched me, she went like, you're a healer. And I was like, what? A healer, what? <laughs> and <laughs> and what does like, that mean? You're a healer, what does it mean? And she introduced me to her teacher. And uh, I can't remember uh, David's last name, but I remember seeing him in Victoria for like almost a year. I used to go in there. And when he started really working energetically, it really reminded me the the person who worked with me when I was almost dying back in Macedonia. So he started really awakening all those healing abilities within me. And he, he told me the same thing. You're a born healer. And then here I am being very arrogant, young kid. I said, no, I'm born scientist. You know, I, I, I'm finishing my university. I'm an engineer. I'm this and that. And he went like, that's OK. When you turn 40, your life will change and you'll go around the world and make a big difference in the world. And when I remember that, I actually have the recordings in an old fashioned cassette just to be humble but really the story when we connect the dots in our life and see why we are where we are. Recently, when I lost my mother, I was in Macedonia and I took all of those and I was playing it with my family. Mm. And I look at it back and I, I was crying when I was hearing my own words and hearing this healer's words in 98 that it took 12 years to manifest exactly the time, point in time when you told me the moment you turn 40 you leave the technology world you create your own work and you go around the world do some amazing things yeah so tell us about that because that's what we want to talk about isn't it so you've left <laughs> this technology job and you've you've decided to to go out on your own and and you're speaking all around the world you're coaching so tell us more about that well, basically, during the 2008-2009, many people experienced the pain of the financial crisis, global financial crisis. You know, so many people lost yeah. their job. There. Me, three times that year. <laughs> yes. yes. So I, I relate. <laughs> So there are many people going through massive transitions. and uh, But also I, I had so many people in London who actually lost their lives because they committed suicide mm. as a result in a bank. And that really brought me back to the realization that although I achieved this massive success in the business world, I still haven't fulfilled that desire as a kid to, to really produce my own work and empower people. So 2009, I was the last one to be made redundant in my former company. And between 2009 and 2010, it was impossible for me to find a job. So everybody told me that nobody is employing senior IT CIOs and head of departments. So everybody said to me, there's nothing in the market. So for the whole year, I turned and I used some of my redundancy money to interview people. I wanted to know what is the impact of people going through this process because some people lost their lives. And I said, what is it that some people can very quickly turn their life around and other people emotionally get stuck with the pain they experience? So having interviewed a few hundred people in 2010, I really decided I have to do something about it. But because I didn't have the money, I said to myself, OK, I need to still do some technology work until I really find some clarity around what I wanted to do. So at the time, I used to work a lot of healing work and a lot of coaching work before I got my next contract. And between the two contracts, I was hired to work with a client in South Africa in Durban. They hired me to work with their children because they had some problems at school and problems with anger and issues like that. But also them as uh, white South African, very wealthy farmers, they really had the family issues around it. And basically their grandmother was murdered. So there was a lot of things going on. So they hired me for three weeks to do a lot of healing and mentoring and grieving and coaching work. And at the same time, I got a very good job to work for the government. So I, I turned around to the people who hired me. I said, I have to do this three weeks, but when I come back, I'll continue. And I actually was in charge of a massive technology upgrade of the, uh, of the government, of an investment management system. And so the next 14 months while I was doing that, I started building my business. 
I started to get the clarity of what really I wanted. And one of the things which working in technology for almost 18 years, what made me think it's like how fast technology changes, how fast we upgrade things. Yeah. You know, went through no networks in the corporate world, no websites, banks, and there was nothing in the like uh, 90s or the 80s. And suddenly we have this boom in technology where suddenly people could connect with everybody. Facebook came alive, uh, YouTube came alive, uh, all the social media, like we started having fast broadbands. I mean, uh, probably you remember the dial-up modems that we used to just, have. Just, Tony, just. I don't know. How old do you think I am? No, but... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yes, of course I do. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it, if you think about it, we've gone from dial-up to fiber optic in less than 20 years. I know, it's insane, isn't and it? The information we can share and the, the, the way the business has transformed, not only from a marketing perspective, but only from the sales perspective, but in the way we can connect and collaborate with one another and the amount of data that has been done. And I said to myself, how come people don't upgrade themselves as fast as we upgrade the technology? Yeah. And so I went into this uh, meditation, but I also did a mini MBA business boosting course called uh, Key Person of Influence uh, with uh, the founder is Daniel Priestley, because a part of that was to actually write your own book. The rest of the modules I've been working 20 years in the business world. So pretty much I was very uh, at the top of my field, but I always wanted to have somebody to coach me to really bring all of these 30 years of experience into a unique methodology that can help people consistently upgrade their systems and models of living so they can consciously re-engineer their reality, yeah. grow their business and focus their time so they can really truly achieve quantum leaps in all of the key areas of life. Because if we don't do that, somebody else will overpower us. And I've seen that consistently through my life and all the clients that I work. So some people, when they focus on business, they don't have a relationship. Somebody who has a great relationship overpowers them and you feel an inadequate next to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's essential for us to empower those. So I wanted to create something that people can consistently bring about. So this is when I wrote a, um, a Path to Wisdom in 2014. I published it and instantly became an international bestseller ahead of Tony Robbins, ahead of Louis Say, ahead of... Uh, Deepak Chopra Incredible. and all the teachers that I loved. And I said to myself, is this real? And this is where it really hit me because my mentor, Dr. John Martini, when I actually met him, when I showed him the methodology, he actually became uh, the person who actually wrote the foreword for both of my books. And to get the, I would say, the endorsement of some of the top of the top in the world. Yeah. And it, it was really, really humbling, but also a reality check that I'm on the right track. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know that you, I mean, your story is obviously just so um, authentic and your methodology that you talk about, I think is called ALARM. Is that right? Yeah, it's called the TJS method. The acronym is ALARM. Oh, the acronym and it's is like, ALARM. And it's basically principles, 25 principles that when you follow in certain order and you consistently work of them, you truly achieve miracles in your life. And miracles means different things to different people. It means the things that we think it's impossible, we suddenly create it. Uh, but it's not sudden, it's actually consciously, you re-engineer your life, your thoughts, your beliefs, your values towards the things that we want. So in a sense, I wanted a methodology that helps people unlock all the things they've learned, like law of the attraction. Everybody has learned about the law of the attraction. Everybody believes in that, but they find themselves not really living it. Yeah, right, so, right, right, right. <laughs> To give people a tool that can go beyond that, because as, as people, we both expand and elevate our awareness and our consciousness. Fantastic. So the book was the big game changer for you, I think you're, you're suggesting, which is kind of what got you to, you know, that that international best selling title. What happened from there? What else did that do for you? What doors did that open? Um, in the book, when I wrote my first book, A Path to Wisdom, not only opened the doors to the world. But actually, ever since, like there's been a, almost a million copies that people have read it digitally through audiobooks and stuff like that. So I started receiving a lot of clients. It actually became the marketing tool for me. So suddenly, I had people from around the world hire me to work with them privately, to be interviewed. I've been interviewed over 100 TV and radio stations globally as a result of that. But also, it set the foundation of my teachings, the foundations of creating an institute of the wisdom that I've been uh, creating for the last 30 years to help people to really transform 
everything about their life, to heal their life, because I see a lot of people who chase the money, chase the business, but they suffer emotionally, they suffer physically, they suffer in other areas in their life. Yeah. And I see people who have great relationship, but they don't have a lot of money. So it's, I wanted to really create a bridge between the matter and the spirit, because I believe when we create a bridge and we honor the two together, we really transform not only ourselves, not only people we love, not only the society we live, but humanity. So the book really started, uh, created this uh, pathway. And I remember when I wrote it, I wrote the whole vision, what's going to happen to me in the next 10 years. And, you know, I cry every time I go back in time because I created programs out of it. Like one of the programs, which is, has taken me around the world, is a five-day program called Vital Planning for Elevated Living. Mm. And one of the things I noticed that most business owners down there, they have no idea how to plan. And uh, I literally also, somebody might put a plan but they never executed. They right. end up <laughs> uh, yeah. procrastinating on, on it. So I really went thorough. I became very thorough and I created this plan, which basically uh, the booklet that I've used since 2008 to re-engineer my reality and I've created everything. So I, I created a program out of that and now I teach uh, business owners and individuals around the world who hire me to work with them, focused work, one-to-one, really transforming their business, their reality, their finances, their self-worthiness, their confidence, all sorts of issues that uh, most people have that stops them from truly embracing their magnificent self and being able to monetize their wisdom. It's amazing. And so you, I know that you have this ambition to help over, I think it's a billion people that you want to, to help. So what, why the commitment to this goal and where, and where does that stem from? When I was a kid, going back, again, we always have dreams, Stacey. Uh, every child, I believe, has a unique uh, mission when they come into this world. And uh, as children, we are, don't think a lot about other people's opinions. Yeah, that's right. We are free to explore. I mean, if you observe children, uh, sometimes in my leadership training, I get people to behave like children. And it's amazing what I would say intelligence comes out of it and what creativity comes, uh, comes out of it. As children, we pretty much are very connected to what we want to do. So as a child, for me, I wanted to be a, a, a space captain. I wanted to be a heart surgeon. I wanted to be an engineer and an architect. So I've actually, now I live my life being all those four things. So you may say, yeah. how come a space captain? Well, I take people beyond their limits. So when you look at the, you know, Star Trek, to boldly go where no man has gone before. And it's exactly what I do with my clients. I take them into a space of exploration where they can really create, innovate, and serve other people. Mm. And when it comes to being a heart surgeon, I'm actually a heart healer. For most of my clients who do my integrated work and healing, I help people heal their hearts from many different wounds that they have through their life. So I've achieved that one. And then when you talk about being an engineer and architect, it's exactly what I do with people. I re-engineer their mind to really create the beauty inside of their mind so their external reality matches. So great. I like that a lot. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that you have these dreams as a child and then a lot of people let them sort of slip away or lose track of them or I'm not really sure what happens. Maybe you you know the answer to that question, but I think people feel very passionate about that, that you've, as a child, you just, you're not concerned with what is possible. You just have a dream, right? Yeah. And you don't focus so much on how you're going to achieve it. You just think big. Absolutely spot on. Right. And I, I find that incredibly fascinating. And I think it's a shame that it gets lost. <laughs> it really is. Because <laughs> you do have these beautiful dreams as a kid as to things that you want to accomplish. And, and sometimes not, you know, sometimes, you you know, people's ambitions aren't, aren't that big, but that's fine. And I think it's just having that uh, confidence to be able to put it out there into the world and just be content with that and be happy with what it is that you actually want to achieve. So I think... I love that. I think um, it made me think of an exercise that we'll often do sometimes with regards to marketing in terms of, you know, often when you're planning how, what sort of objective you actually want to achieve and you're trying to ask a client that and then often they don't, sometimes they, they've got a very blanket answer. And I always ask my team to act like a five-year-old. <laughs> and what I mean by that yep. is just say, but why, but why? But why? But why do you want to achieve those 100,000 followers on Instagram? But why do you want just really digging into the actual reason? Because a lot of people don't go that deep. It's very superficial. 
type of stuff. And I know that's a, a totally different analogy to what you're talking about, but a, a similar concept and thinking, just making it simple, like thinking like a child. I, I really do think that that's a... I mean, in Path to Wisdom, I talk about the three important states that every human being has, which is our inner child, inner adult and inner parent. And I talk about how to harmonize those. There's a whole chapter in that because the majority of the problems are because there's no harmony across those three states within the individual. And no matter what business, I, I've worked with businesses ranging from six figure to a billion. No matter what the problem was, bottom line, it's, it's the answer, it's the clarity the person gets within themselves. Because systems outside of ourselves, you can very easily do once you have clarity inside. And what I see the biggest problem when it comes to people growing their businesses, when it comes to people marketing their businesses, majority of people try to be everything to themselves. Mm. I always recommend people go and ask help. Now, even if you get, for instance, you're running a marketing agency, even if they start small with you, the fact that they commit to that, that's on its own worth millions. A lot of people are afraid to commit. Yeah. I'm sharing this because I'm somebody who believes in personal development and professional and business development. I've been investing in myself consistently for 30 years. Although today I'm considered as one of the leading experts in the world and serving some billionaires who actually were my mentors, now they're hiring me to help them. I still continue having three teachers around me. Because when people say to other people, you know, you don't need this, you have it all inside. Well, that goes against nature, Stacey. And you know why? It goes against nature because if Mother Earth had the same intelligence, we would not need people to create buildings and to create everything we've created. So it means Mother Earth has all the elements, but everything we see is man-made. Right, yeah. It's the same. Any coaching, any service is out there to help you extract that wisdom inside of you, which you may not necessarily have the skill to be able to create it in a way that an expert can do in your life. Yeah. So I always recommend people, you know, when people say to me, I don't have money, I went like, you know what? I don't believe that. Uh, a person who does not have money does not have a home does not have clothes, does not eat, does not have anything. So the first thing is I break those illusions that people tell themselves. And they suddenly, they really realize they do have the money, but they're not making the choice to invest in what can actually bring long-term success in their life. They have very short vision and the way they actually use their money, it's in what they perceive value may be. Because some people may perceive like, you know, having their hair do every three days because yeah. they want to look amazing. But if you look the bill behind that, yeah. it's massive. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, recently I was interviewed in Macedonia when they said to me, Tony, you're expensive. I said, really? Let me show you how, how cheap I am in comparison. So live on TV, I took a family and I went and broke down what they spend on. They actually cried because they realized that my fees are very cheap in comparison to what they're spending. Right, yeah. Because like a family of five who smokes uh, a pack of cigarettes, that's... You know, that's five times 30, 150 packs of cigarette times uh, five quid. How much is that? That's thousand pounds only on cigarettes. Yeah. I recently did this exercise myself and was terrified to learn that I yep. spend about two and a half thousand pounds a year on coffee. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Those are the <laughs> Devastating. Tips, uh, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, this is the things when I say to people, and one of the things I teach people, Stacey, it's because when I went through this journey, even when I was made redundant, I actually, when I first time worked with Dr. John DiMartini, uh, his fees are like a whole salary, month salary for one hour. And first time I went in there, my entire being shook. I said, how on earth can I actually pay this? But then second time I went back and I said, you know what? I'm going to take five jobs and I'm going to pay for this. I want to know what this person knows. And that mindset has served me extremely well into growing my business. So I always tell people, never tell yourself, I don't have it, but ask yourself, how can I create it? Yeah, I like that. That's great. So how might, for example, you know, our audience are fairly small business owners. They're, some of them are solopreneurs, so just working alone in their businesses, or perhaps have a very small team. So I think in terms of thinking about how they might approach a problem or getting access to the resources that they might need to help to maximize their human potential and sort of go on to create those extraordinary things. Where do they begin? Where's the first, where's the first starting point? 
Well, the first starting point is no matter where you are in your business, uh, you already started a business because you have something valuable. So nobody with their right mind will actually start a business if they don't have something valuable. Now, I personally, I don't teach people to go and borrow money. What I teach people is to be of service and make money. Because one, it's a poverty mindset and one, it's a growth mindset. Now, uh, you know, I was interviewed for a homeless charity and they asked me, Tony, you know, what these homeless people can do apart from borrowing money. I said, well, I can show you my story. It's when I was homeless, I actually used to stand in front of supermarkets and carry people's bags and people would pay me for that. I didn't even ask a penny out of it. Mm. So there's many ways you can actually make money. So if you actually want to market your business and you don't have big budgets, today's world, we have so many tools where you can market your business. But uh, I see many people spend a lot of time on social media. Now, personally, I tell people I spent about an hour a day on social media, but I go and meet people. Go out there and meet your ideal clients. Go into the events where these people hang around. Go into networking events. People do not buy a product. They will buy the person who sells the product. I do agree with you on a certain level with regards to that, because I think you can run the most incredible social media campaigns, but without showing off what the who the person is behind the brand often and what they stand for, I think it becomes very, very challenging. So, yeah, you're right. When there isn't a big budget there to be able to show off, you know, video content and, and all that kind of thing to display what that person stands for, what that brand stands for, that's a really effective way to do it. And I think you know, I was having this conversation the other day with another business owner um, around doing this via Instagram direct messaging and even LinkedIn direct messaging where you have those tools. LinkedIn is a free tool. You know, you can get on there. You can be connecting with a lot of different people, getting to know them a little bit. You can see their whole background. They basically lay out their entire CV on LinkedIn. And it's a really great way for you to start a conversation. And then, yeah, if you don't have the budget to do the digital marketing, to be able to take that conversation offline, meet in person, go to different events. There are there's a lot of free events out there as well um, or you know ones that are very minimal cost as we said Stacy so there's no such thing as people don't have money because you wouldn't start a business if you don't have money uh, they just use the money on other things now if the business is important to you uh, you know when I started my business I survived on slice of bread and and baked beans that was my diet for a year so I'm not saying everybody should do that. What I'm saying is there's always a choice of how to allocate whatever money you have to do that. As you mentioned, there's so many tools out there that are for free, but limit your time in those tools. But also have some kind of plan that basically saying, okay, for six months, I'm doing that. After six months, for instance, I hire a marketing agency. They come to you and say, by the way, this is my budget. What can you do to help? What is the minimum thing you can do for us to help? But also one of the things that I've, I've exercised in my own business and I teach a lot of businesses is the power of joint ventures. Now, if you have a product which is very desirable and you have a great brand, you actually go and partner with somebody who has a massive distribution. Right. So, and if, uh, for me, it's always a product, brand and distribution and any combination, if you own two of those, you can go into any joint venture. Like for instance, uh, as you probably know, uh, I've co-created a documentary series. So living my illusion. Correct. Yeah. So basically uh, I co-partnered with my clients because I have a great brand and I have a great product. And basically they wanted to create something outside of the existing technology business. And my client was always into film. He wanted to really take the work that had been experiencing through me for the last two and a half years, both in their business and in their personal life, to as many people as possible. So we ended up creating a, a joint venture and creating this amazing documentary series that people can use it as a mirror to self-reflect and in a sense to learn the 25 principles through real life documentaries from real people who open their doors you know, because most successful people, they have this massive facade and they don't let everybody in. So what we wanted to show is even the successful people have the same problem as every human being on the planet. And how they can use that to become successful and to overcome certain things with ease without having to go through my pain for 30 years and learn those things. So, you know, this is what we as experts do out there. We save people time. So whether it's myself or you as a marketing agency, when people come to us, they come because they want to save their time and bring them to the ideal customer and do the ideal. For me, it's helping them create the ideal work. I don't help people how to market themselves. There's marketing agency. 
I'm an expert in behavioral science, emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, into well-being, uh, building a business and helping people get the clarity of the kind of work they want to do. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. And to be honest with you, it plays a really big part when you do decide to market a business, because before you can market a product, a service, or even yourself, whether that's you, whether you are using free tools like social media to market yourself, if you don't know who you are as a person, what you stand for, what your core beliefs are, and what you're trying to achieve, then the rest of it's useless. So it's the very beginning of that entire funnel. It is the beginning because you mentioned earlier on uh, a path to wisdom and I originally brought all of my ideas together and I created something original. And I always say to people, forget what's out there. There's something original inside of you. Like all of the clients, uh, hundreds and thousands of people I work, I help them create original work. And when there is original work, no matter how much noise there is out there, you, if you remain consistent in your work, you will actually break through that. But what I've seen nowadays, a lot of people just go and write books, but there's nothing in that book that you cannot find on Google. And there's not really real value that you can monetize. So, but when you bring something and you work with somebody to extract something and you create a unique process, a unique methodology, a unique way, for instance, in your case, unique way of marketing people's business where people can see true breakthroughs, people will come to you. I don't really compare with other coaches or mentors because my work is like integrated work. It's gone beyond coaching, beyond mentorship. So people who come to me, they are ready at that level and they want to go further. And I think that's what people are looking for too. They are looking for that. You're using the term methodology, but they're looking for that system. You know, they want to know. They Most people know, if I use myself as an example, marketing, a lot of people know the principles of marketing. But for whatever reason, they aren't, they don't know the systems and orders in which you should do them. They're not sure of the little bits as it gets broken down. So something like a method or a system that demonstrates that to people is valuable. You know, I love that you've actually said that about that's sort of what you focus on in the book, because I've actually found the same thing myself. I think by by creating a, a method and a system in which you follow that is unique to our agency, for example, that helps people to understand how we will carry out that work. And then that makes it that an easier decision to want to go ahead and hire you. You know, same thing applies to yourself. You've got your 25 points. People understand this is the process that you're going to be taking them through. These are the areas they're going to have to be working on. That's an easy purchase decision for somebody to make because they get it. It's not just a whole lot of fluff and this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, we're going to change your life. So we're going to make you more powerful and you're going to be, you know, maximizing your potential and all of this kind of stuff. You've actually shown them there's a process, there's a proven process that you've taken multiple people through over the last 30 years worth of experience. And it's actually in something tangible that somebody can understand. I mean, one of the things that I, you know, I'll share with you. So, for instance, when I get a client who has a consultation with me and whatever reason they approach me, and one of the things I always ask them, no matter what the client is, I ask them, are you married? Okay, yeah. <laughs> and it might be a strange question, but I, when I give them the metaphor I'm about to share, it really sits in their head and say, oh, my God, this is so true. And the reason I'm asking that, so the work that I do, it's almost upgrading you very fast. Now, I take the methodology and I create a little network and then I put two computers. One is DOS computer and one is Windows 12. And then I ask my client saying, OK, so you doing this work with me, you end up Windows 12. And if your partner is not doing it, they're on DOS. What kind of communications do you think you're going to have with that person? And they start laughing. <laughs> they said, no, we will have arguments. We won't be able to understand each other. Yeah. And some people who've done personal development, they find themselves in disempowering relationships because the other partner is not at the same rate as you are. Mm, okay. And this is what I've done with, uh, in the documentary, we actually show this. And my client's wife had to go on this program herself, not because I said to her, because she realized, one, the power, two, what can happen to her doing this work and really uh, the amazing work that uh, ended up three years down the line and we continue in doing that work. Because by default, uh, Stacey, we are designed to grow. Yeah. By default, no matter what that growth is, because some people will find growth to be they devote their life to a charity or to their children or to schooling. For me, like, you know, this big vision going out there, bringing this work to a billion people so I can contribute towards planetary changes and humanitarian changes and help more people become healthy, wealthy and wise. 
for other people might be here. I'll be the top uh, marketing agency for you might be that basically serves a conscious community that actually bring their businesses to the right client. Each one of us has this unique mission, but most people, they don't have clarity around that. It's entirely true. Yeah. And I think especially as small businesses or perhaps it's because businesses evolve, they evolve quite quickly in those early stages too, that you can start off with one ambition or one objective or one direction that you think that you're going to go in. And then things do change and you do adapt and things move and move around. And there's lots of different directions you end up going in and perhaps those directions change a little bit. Yeah. It's just a really interesting concept, isn't it? To be thinking about yeah, I mean, the new millennial, the new millennial entrepreneurs, they're much more adaptable. But I've got clients who are old business owners. They still think with the old way of thinking how the business runs. And unfortunately, we have those problems even in government leadership that we see what's happening through Brexit and all of those things, where basically people hold on to a vision that was there 60 years ago. We live in a 21st century with a globalist mindset. You know, our businesses are global. My clients are all over the world. And personally, and I know all the clients that I work with, they don't want restrictions. They don't want having to deal with 27 different visas for them to be able to go and work in Europe. They want the freedom to be able to go settle down, work, sell their products and have one system. So, you know, in 21st century, it's, uh, it's really, you can see the effect of bad leadership in every area, in every business. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about, I mean, you've touched on this already in terms of how you attract people into your business, because I'm interested in, in marketing methods, obviously, and how and how people use different marketing materials or strategies to attract clients. So I know you've mentioned your book, obviously, that was a that was a big impact for you. You've obviously got the, your documentary, which is fantastic. What else are you doing? What are your other sort of streams of leads? Uh, I can ne never stress enough the importance of publicity. Meaning, get yourself, if you have a good product, if you have a good book, uh, whatever it may be, and you can resolve a specific problem, go out there and approach TV stations, approach radio stations. You know, I've sold a lot of books and I got a lot of clients just being on TV and on radio. Because a lot of people, they send stuff, general stuff. Now, you can imagine so many people wanted to market their businesses. No journalist out there will look at an email which is long or something which is very general. But if you go, let's say you want to appear on a specific magazine or press and stuff like that, research the journalists, research their programs and see how your work links with their work and then offer something nobody has for so far. Like, for instance, when I launched my first book, A Path to Wisdom, I sent 5,000 personal messages to people explaining my project, explaining my vision and how the book may help them, their families, their business, their society. And that's how I first became a bestseller. And then I went in all of my network, all the people I've met in the last 17 years, I either call them, I send them a personal email message because I didn't have the budgets to do all of those things, to get somebody to do it. So there's no excuse for anybody not to grow their business. There's so many things you can do, but most importantly, show up. Show up at events, show up in uh, wherever your client is. Like today, for instance, in the last 10 days, I usually take time, lunchtime. Anybody who is my reader and they bought a book, when they approach me and saying, I want to take you out for a coffee, I make time to meet them for a coffee and sign the book. And not just that, anybody who's around me, I speak. Now, recently, in the last 10 days, I met about 10 different people just being at a, uh, one of my favorite uh, coffee shop on my lunch break. And I randomly strike conversation. People are afraid to talk to people. Yeah. And this is why I talk about in hashtag loneliness, the virus of modern age. We've become a nation where we glued to technology. We forget that the most incredible person may be sitting next to you. And actually, I met a billionaire sitting in a normal coffee shop that six months down the line, he called me up and said, Tony, I need your help. Then I met a millionaire, an artist who literally lives locally. And he's a young artist with music and everything else. And I'm the following relationship. Six months, he might turn around and said, Tony, you know what? I need your help. Yeah. But just be upset. Be present. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I think we are afraid to talk to people in real life and I'm not sure why that's happened or or whatever, but you do just be incredible people. I've had many conversations with people on airplanes or whatever that you're just stuck next to for a few hours and you have great conversations and you just, they result in something, maybe not the next day, maybe not tomorrow, but sometimes six months, a year down the line, you, your paths cross again and they bring business to you. So I, I completely, you know, even I'm in the digital space, but I completely agree prior to actually getting into the digital space I worked in sales so I was in direct sales face to face you know meeting people so I work a lot with traditional businesses like that and I really help them to to build their brands online and, and generate business online as well as offline so I completely support I think that direct approach and just that relationship development it really does go a long way yeah I mean one of the things Stacey is uh, when people always people who know me especially my personal clients because they start integrating getting to know each other I don't chase business. I always think my my thinking head is always on how can I help another human being? How else can I contribute towards whatever they're doing? How else can I make it bigger? How else can I make it more efficient? How can I save them time? How can I help them be healthy, wealthy, and really be able to transform the world? Because the kind of clients I work, they're already established, but they have their own challenges. You know. The more you're going to serve, the more you're going to grow your company, the more you as a business owner will have bigger challenges. And this is why I say to people, when you are in that space, have somebody, a good teacher who can be there with you. Because, you know, it's sort of naturally, you know, when you ask earlier on why people don't apply those things, because there's so much noise. We are constantly being distracted with everything Mm -hmm. outside of ourselves. Yeah, it's true. So, and we have so much choice and sometimes this choice is really confuses people and especially people who've never run a business before and their circumstances put them into doing something about it. Like for both of us, we experienced at the same time uh, redundancy and we both worked in the corporate world. So I've seen people tell me I'm a business coach and they've never worked in business and they're wondering why they don't have clients. And I said, well, Hold on a bit. If you came to business coach me, you have to run at least a hundred million pound business coaching so I can actually hire you. So some people try to get a client which is not relevant to them. So I always say to people, no matter what expertise you are, if you're trying to go above your expertise, uh, people will ridicule you. So serve the client that need your expertise and learn from the clients who've achieved the things you want to achieve. Yeah, that's great advice. I love that. It's really, really good. Tony, tell us how we can reach you. How can we find you online? How can our audience connect with you? Well, I have my main website, which is TonySalimi.com, T-O-N-Y-Salimi, S-E-L-I-M-I.com. And in there you have all the links to all my different social media, my Instagram, my Twitter, but also people can download a free chapter of my book in there and sign up to my uh, weekly inspirational newsletter. I send always like quotes to really inspire your soul. So, you know, I create quotes after every session with my clients. Probably if you've noticed me online on Facebook or other things, I literally create quotes designed around after having a client session. And I summarize everything, what this person is going through, and I create a unique quote. I love that, being able to document your journey. Well, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Your story is absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm really looking forward to actually checking out your methodology in a lot more detail. And I really encourage all of our listeners to connect with you as well and follow your journey and learn from it, as well as checking out your documentary, because that sounds absolutely fascinating. (laughs) I really can't wait to hear about it. So thank you so much for joining us. I know you're a busy man, and I've really appreciated having you here on the show. Stacey, thank you so much and all the best to all the listeners. And remember, you are an intelligent by design. Wonderful. Thanks, Tony. How interesting was that conversation with Tony? I could just talk to him forever. Here are my top three attention grabbers from this episode. Attention grabber number one, focus on all areas of life. It's really easy for us as business owners to get caught up in everything that we want to accomplish in our business and neglect some of our personal relationships or even our health. So remembering to focus our attention on all areas of our life is going to enable us more success. Attention grabber number two, marketing does not have to be expensive. Tony gave us an excellent example of reaching out to 5,000 people personally sending direct messages to tell them about the launch of his book. 
and listen to all the media coverage that he managed to get from journalists, reporters, from TV channels. You know, we can invest resources like our own time in generating marketing for the business. It doesn't all have to be a lot of money that we spend on marketing services or agencies or any of that kind of thing. Attention grabber number three, limitations. Stop thinking, I don't have enough money or I don't have enough clients. We should be focusing on how can I create it? Imagine if we all focused on what if or thought about things in a more positive way. What we'd be able to achieve would be absolutely limitless. So that's it for this episode. Don't forget to visit Tony's website and download a chapter of his book. I look forward to you joining me next time. We'll be meeting another business owner who will unlock their vault of marketing knowledge and provide us access to the secrets to their business success. You've just been listening to The Vault Podcast with Stacey Keogh. If you've enjoyed the show, she'd really appreciate you leaving a review on iTunes. And don't forget to head over to www.thevault.global for more free content that will help you build an effective marketing strategy.